Hell or hell? Lubna, <laughs> uh. yeah. will you let us know when? Because I don't know if our screen changes to let us know. Countdown. You are live. You are okay to start in like two minutes. <laughs> All right, I see us live. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll give you guys a couple minutes to join because um, we're, uh, we're still a little early. I know uh, RCM is known, mashallah, for being on time, but early is, is, is good too. We <laughs> don't want to start too early, but um, salam alaikum everybody, welcome. Well, please give you uh, a moment to get logged in. And our panelists, you guys can all hear me okay and and hear each other, hopefully. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. It feels weird starting early. Should we just go ahead and start? I don't know. Give me two minutes, but I'm trying to get it on the website. So just give me two okay. minutes. Okay. We can we can chat if you guys want. So no one's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not just awkwardly um we're not just awkwardly looking at each other on our little uh Zoom screen. But anyway, I'm just glad you guys are all able to make it. Um we have uh, uh a new addition to our panel that wasn't on our original advertisement. So hopefully we'll get everybody um, excited to welcome uh, Jeff Atkinson today, but we'll, we'll get into introductions in a moment, but hopefully you guys are all doing well on this uh, toasty Sunday. It was so hot. I don't know about you guys, yes. but today was hotter than I ha I've seen it for the last few days. It's, it's gotten kind of, I think with the sun, a little, the humidity was getting to me earlier. Starting to look like August in <laughs> yeah. Georgia. I thought we got lucky though. This summer hasn't been as bad overall. You're right. It hasn't. So we, hopefully we didn't jinx ourselves with just getting some good, uh, <laughs> not too, too bad heat, but we'll see. Still have a little bit left of summer. Well, and I think right now the kids are in a, at a pinnacle of stress because they're getting ready to start school in what, two weeks? And it's just, you know, such an unknown right now for them. I know. I, we start actually next week in Cobb. So right, so some people are starting next week, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's really crazy to me. I mean, August 2nd is their first day and that's basically the middle of our summer back where I grew up in Michigan. Like that, that was, we still had another month because we'd start after Labor Day and it's like, right. it doesn't feel like summer is coming to a close, but school starting. Yeah, school is starting. Yes. But that's, that's exactly why we're here to talk about you know, now that we're in back to school here in Georgia, um, our community is kind of out of, uh, uh, you know, just complete virtual transitioning to a hybrid model with schools. And now we're going back to in-person possibly. Um, so just conversations about um, just issues in, in relation to school and with our youth in general with regards to mental health and anxiety. So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Hopefully Lubna's all set with her um setting it up on um the website you're good to go yep perfect all right well let's start then officially assalamu alaikum everybody thank you for joining us hopefully um we will have a fun and productive discussion um also casual please feel free to post your questions um on the facebook live stream uh the comments will be 
the questions and the comments will be read and included into our conversation. Um, at the same time, we have an esteemed panel that will have a lot to share and um, you will benefit from their experience and their expertise. Um, I, I will give them the floor to introduce themselves. I just wanna kind of give you a brief idea of what we're here to talk about. As we mentioned, we're back to school, a lot of, um, anxiety, not just with the kids in that transition, um, you know, parents as well, especially since we're still in a pandemic world. Um, I think uh, it is not necessarily a traditionally discussed topic when we talk about mental health in a Muslim community. It's not something I grew up discussing um, growing up in the US. Um, and I think this needs to change because obviously no one is um, immune to having, um, you know, uh, concerns or, or mental health kind of care needs to be something that needs to be uh, a conversation and a topic of discussion and not something shunned and stigmatized um, because everybody has to, to deal with it. We all do. I mean, just like we deal with our physical health, this is something we need to discuss and kind of all have a common understanding about how best to approach. Everyone has, you know, sometimes we're all, we're all feeling alone, but suffering from the same kind of concerns and, you know, depression potentially or whatever, um, issues uh, you know, we might be going through. So it helps to know we're not alone and it helps to know there are experts out there that are, that are out there helping us and our kids. So, so here we are hopefully starting one of many conversations. Inshallah, we'll introduce our panel and, and you can reach out to them directly after this um, if you want to continue the conversation. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started and, and we'll have our panelists introduce themselves and we'll start with um, uh, Dr. Laura Bedouin. You want to start us off? Maybe yes, thank you. Thank you, Habed. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, so my name is Dr. Laura Badwin, and I am a pediatrician here in the East Cobb area. I work at um, the uh, local practice, and I've been doing pediatrics for almost 20 years now. Started off in the hospital-based setting and then have moved over to more of the outpatient setting. Um, this is a very timely discussion. We were, the panel and I were talking before we started, this was a problem before COVID, um, anxiety and depression in the community. And it's just been amplified since the pandemic started. So I think it's great to kind of start the conversation rolling within the Muslim community and hopefully provide some resources and tips for families and the kids. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Red. I must add that she's um, not just an amazing pediatrician because she's our pediatrician, but because uh, she's my neighbor and friend. And so you guys are gonna love hearing from her. I'm, I'm positive this is gonna be amazing. So we have also um, Mr. Ihab Jadid. You wanna introduce yourself? Hey, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much about, uh, for this opportunity. Um, so my name is Ihab Jalil. I am uh, the executive director for Amana Academy Charter School, uh, one of the Fulton County charter schools. And um, we, uh, I think, navigated through the pandemic very well last year, um, having done mostly um, remote learning for half of the year and then switching over to a hybrid model mid-year. Um, and we learned a lot from that experience about our students, about our staff, about ourselves. And um, I'm eager to, to share whatever we learned through that experience and just looking forward to coming back face to face. And that poses uh, new challenges for us. Um, so looking forward to sharing whatever I know. And um, I also wanted to just mention that we're part of a network of schools called uh, EL, <clears throat> EL education schools used to be called expeditionary learning. Um, it's a Harvard based model um, that really focuses not just on the mastery of knowledge and skills, but also on character of students and the social and emotional support that they need, uh, in addition to high quality work as well. So um, we've learned a lot from that relationship and that network of schools. And so um, whatever I can share from there, that that'll be helpful too. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, but I know you're really, really busy. So uh, even on a Sunday, I'm sure you've got other things going on. So we really appreciate your time. Um, and then last but not least, we have our uh, guest, Jeff Atkinson. Um, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself, Jeff. Sure. I'm Jeff Atkinson. I'm a licensed professional counselor and I practice in the Alpharetta area. I've been licensed since 1997. I have Lots of different specializations, but one of them is working with people that have been uh, faced with trauma 
And um, I've learned a lot of different ways to help them deal with stress over the years. Um, but also, you know, stress is on a continuum. So, you know, I, I also see kids that might not even really fit a, uh, a mental health diagnosis, but just are more stressed about, uh, you know, some of the things that we're deal all dealing with right now in the pandemic. And so I've definitely seen an increase in that, uh, you know, where I think for one thing, families have had more time to, to really look at their kids. And I mean, that sounds kind of strange, but, you know, when we're all busy and we're all working out of the house, you know, where we don't have as much time until we're like maybe at the dinner table or something, but ha having everybody together, I think parents have had a little more time to just kind of get to know their kids better. And, and there's more of a, a connection where they see, oh, well, you know, my kid's a little more stressed. They're not sleeping as well. They're not eating as well. Maybe I'll get them some help. And um, so, you know, that's been great to be there for them. Uh, so I'm, I'm here to, to try to impart some, some, some uh, assistance with that. And, and also I'm a parent, uh, you know, with the 16 and a 19 year old boys. And so some of us, you know, have been even on in this, the community that you're in, have all been through, you know, the kids have the same grades and gone to the same schools and we've been through some of the same trials and tribulations. So, uh, you know, I think that, you know, sometimes, uh, really gives you more experience than anything, just being a parent. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for your time. I know this was a, a last minute uh, request on my part, but I'm so grateful that you accepted and that all of you are all um, able to join us. And I, again, I encourage everybody watching live, please go ahead and post your questions. This is a discussion and not a lecture. Um, and we'll hopefully you'll have some um, things and, and uh, perspectives to contribute and some tips as well as listeners. Um, I, I did wanna start the conversation off just to get everybody's, you know, hopefully attention because I think a lot of people, um, myself included, think, you know, well, we all go through stress and our kids may be, um, you know, they, they have their ups and downs. They, they stress when there's like a test at school or, you know, whatnot. How do I know what to look out for? What, how do I know if there's an issue? I, I don't, you know, necessarily assume that just because they're stressed that there's a problem. How, what can I do to identify concerns and how can I prevent them? So I, I feel like this might be something uh, good to start us off with just because I, I don't want people out there to assume that just because their kids aren't having or themselves maybe some extreme, you know, exhibiting extreme symptoms that would definitely alert them that there may still be something that we can do to, to help our children and ourselves out with, a, with this um, mental health um, uh, question. So go ahead and, and you guys jump in. Well, well, I think, I mean, if you don't mind, uh, I, I think one of the biggest things to make sure is to make sure our kids are talking about what's, what's going on in their lives. And so, you know, of course it would be best if they could start with talking with their parents um, and, and so, you know, having that flow of communication is so important. And if you see some kind of change in that, um, you know, then that's one sign right there that maybe something now, if they're going through some type of different, you know, develop, developmental stage where maybe they are pulling away from their parents a little more, you know, we want to make sure that they're having, they have that support system and, and, you know, whether it's another, maybe it's another family member or maybe it's a responsible member of the community or religious leader or somebody, but we need to make sure that they're, they're talking to somebody. And so if you see them isolating, you see them, you know, kind of be into themselves, you know, when, when they're going through all this, you know, one of the things that I try to do with my clients is try to figure out what in the stress in their life, what is controllable and what is not controllable. And so when you have things that, that are uncontrollable in their own life, you know, so the pandemic, you know, right now they're getting ready to face, you know, this whole new thing, this whole new idea of going to school together, uh, you know, so I mean, they, they really haven't done that for a while. So there's all these things that are these worries probably that they're having, you know, make sure that they're having one of the things that research says to help with that is just to be able to talk about it. You know, when we're dealing with uncontrollable stressors, you know, the first thing research says is to, you know, you need to be able to talk about it. You need to be able to express it. So, you know, make sure that, that they're talking. And so, you know, the warning sign again would be, are they isolating? Are they, you know, um, are they, you know, 
less energetic? Are they just pulling to themselves? And so if there's some, you know, just more agitated and things like that. So we want to, if, if you can't make the connection and the communication isn't there, then you need to try to build that com communication around them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to echo uh, what Jeff said. I think it's really important, you know, mental health encompasses a lot of different things. So, you know, the most common ones that we hear about all the time are anxiety and depression. And while some of the symptoms that you might see your child or yourself even exhibit can kind of be similar, there are a few differences that, you know, between the two, but you really are looking for um, with regards to anxiety, are they having like a recurring fear all of a sudden? They don't want to go outside. They don't want to play with friends. You know, a fear that maybe wasn't there before and it just, ha you know, is reiterated multiple times. Um, sometimes it can manifest in physical complaints. Are they always complaining of, man, my, my tummy hurts. I don't want to go to school or my head, my head hurts. I don't want to go to school. Um, are they having trouble sleeping or conversely, are they sleeping too much? Um, maybe they used to do so well and could sit down and read a book. And now all of a sudden they're having some difficulty concentrating, um, you know, just fear of being, uh, separated from the parents, you know, it used to be, Oh, my kid was a social butterfly. And now they're no longer doing those things. So those are some of the symptoms that you can see um, with regards to anxiety um, and things that we can keep an eye on as parents, right? The child isn't going to come up and say, hey, I'm anxious. Maybe, maybe some kids are. And for certain things, anxiety is totally healthy and normal, right? We all have anxiety sometimes. I think when it gets the best of us and it keeps us from doing our daily activities, living our life, then that's when it, you know, raises a red flag where, you know what, I think maybe we need to kind of look into this a little bit more. Um, with regards to depression, similar. And, you know, again, some people might think, oh, these are low numbers. Nobody suffers from these. It, you know, in the United States, at least anywhere from 8% and some statistics as high as, you know, 20% of lifetime prevalence of these uh, illnesses within our youth. So we do need to take them seriously, right? That's almost as high as one in five kids are going to be affected by this in one shape or form. But, you know, you can see sadness and irritability. They can just seem burnt out. I mean, I think a lot of adults are feeling that way now with, with COVID, um, being more indecisive, just thoughts maybe of wanting to harm themselves. Like maybe you hear them say, uh, you know, now like, oh, you know, I wish I would die or, oh, I could just, you know, kill myself. Th those types of words that in passing, you might think, oh, well, you know, they're joking. They don't mean it. But I, in this type of world that we're living in now, it's good to put your real listening ears on and take those types of statements seriously. And then with our little ones, because it is hard to tell, like if your, you know, young ones are anxious you know, if they become very fussy or more irritable or their, their behavior changes, those are some of the signs and symptoms overall to look out for. And then you can talk to your pediatrician and uh, you, we have tools to kind of work through those diagnoses. I, I met, you mentioned something um, interesting and I think it, it is uh, important to look out for, for these signs with our kids, but it may be a little harder when it, it's ourselves that are exhibiting some of these um, potentially um, anxiety or depression. And we, it's almost more difficult, I think, uh, to internalize and, and really reflect on whether we're just sad because of stresses at home or and this is just within the realm of normal, or if we need to do something to beyond just, um, you know, kind of feeling our feelings kind of thing. So I don't know what you guys um, have, uh, uh, maybe some experience in, in helping us identify when, when our, you know, emotions are normal and, and, and we're well adjusted and we, we don't really need to do anything differently. Um, or if we, if, you know, if there are red flags that we need to look out for amongst ourselves as, as adults and, and caregivers as, well, well, you have you haven't said anything yet. <laughs> well, I, well, that last question was I think directed more at adults uh, than children. <laughs> so uh, I I I want to defer to the experts on that one. Um, 
I know well, how I'm, I deal how I deal with stress, but uh, um, but well, I don't think I'm so, the expert. So with with parents, I mean that I work with, I mean it's all about self care, you know, and and you know because um, unfortunately this sounds terrible, but you know raising your kids, a lot of it is uncontrollable stress for you because you don't have control over these kids as much as you'd like to a lot of times. So you have to take care of yourself. You have to make sure you're, you're eating well. You have to make sure you're getting good sleep as much as you can, getting your activity, having some fun in your life. Um, you know, so give back to yourself, rejuvenate yourself because yeah, if you let yourself get worn down and then if you do have, you know, of course, mental health issues on top of that, then, you know, then that just projects onto the child and, and that's going to be, you know, really hard for them. I mean, you know, I, I remember <laughs> when my, my kids were young and I remember my oldest looking at me once and saying, you have such a kind face, dad. And then I remember later on when I was more stressed about raising them, wow, dad, you just seem stressed all the time. <laughs> you know, So I mean, it, it's not good to uh, let yourself get run down. So, you know, and I'm sure, you know, all of us here have done that from time to time. So we're, you know, sometimes we let that happen and, and then we got to take care of ourselves. Well, and, and I'm going to uh, definitely piggyback on that and really reinforce what Jeff said around projection, um, adults projecting onto their children, because um, that's something I do see at the school. Um, you know, when adults come in and they're stressed out and they're trying to you know, um, have a discussion with a teacher or with an administrator, if they're stressed out and they're projecting it, you can see it on the child's face. You can see that after that adult leaves, after that parent leaves, that child is still stressed. Um, and it can go on for a lot longer than, than people may, may think. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I find myself sometimes, um, uh, having these kinds of discussions with adults, with parents, um, and, and so some of the same things that Jeff is talking about, um, you know, we, we discuss uh, that people have to take care of themselves too. Uh, absolutely. So what do you do? Yeah, you said you already know what you do to de-stress. What's your... Oh, for, for me, it's, it's, it has a lot to do with things like hiking. Uh, I think connecting to nature is huge for me. Um, you know, everybody has their, their thing. You know, it could be going to a concert. It could be going, uh, you know, being out with friends and so forth. I love reconnecting with nature, um, hiking. And, um, and if I can do it socially with other people, it's even more fun. Um, but that really um, rejuvenates me uh, in a big way. And so that's my thing, adventure and, 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 you know, connection to the natural world. I think it's really important that we remember um, that, these breaks that we need, these mental breaks, don't have to be these long, expensive vacations, right? It could be as much as telling your spouse, like, I need one hour to just kind of leave the house and, you know, either go for a walk or wander the, the aisles of Target, right? I mean, it could be something as simple as that. So we don't have to look at it as, oh, well, I don't have time to take a vacation. That's not really what we're saying but there needs to be time out of each day where you feel that you can unwind as a parent and have your own, you know, me time. Yeah, and, and I would say, you know, I mean, it, the example I use, for example, uh, Laura, I think uh, to your point, like I don't have to go, uh, you know, to Yellowstone Park uh, to, to go hiking. I can do that at the Roswell Mill. And, and it's just beautiful over there. So um, you're absolutely right. It doesn't take a lot of time to do that. Um, I do want to go back, uh, Hib, if you don't mind, to the question that you asked earlier about tests and so forth. And I think that um, I just want to, you know, bef depending on how much time we have, I just want to um, share something that uh, came out of an article that I read recently. Um, I could share it in the chat box, but um, I think it's important that, that children know that <clears throat> they know that we believe in them. Um, I feel like that's incredibly important. So, you know, in terms of like being prepared for a test and, and that anxiety that happens, um, frankly, right now, the conversation in education is 
to de-stress people around testing. Um, and there's, there's, there's a new conversation happening around standardized testing. Is, are we testing kids too much and so forth? And, and I'm very um, pleased to see that that's the conversation that people are having, especially going back into school after this pandemic. Um, but we need, they need to know that we believe in them. And parents, and I, you know, I'll defer to the counselors here, but I feel, feel, feel like parents need to be coaches. Um, they need to, to coach and coaches believe in their players and, and they coach them throughout the process. It's not just, you know, it's not just something that they say once in a while or, or that it's heartfelt. It's actually demonstrated through their actions. And so if a parent is in touch with the teacher, knows when that test is going to happen, they can ask non-threatening questions of their children to say, look, that test is a week out from now. Is there something I could do to help you for it um, so that it's not, you know, a, a last minute kind of anxiety thing? Um, I think there's a lot of ways that, that parents can prepare their kids for those moments, those, those stressful moments so that um, it's less stressful. But let's face it, I mean, taking a test, I mean, nobody, I think, looks forward to tests. Um, so it's a natural thing that, that there is going to be some level of anxiety. And that's why we're being tested. But I think we can coach our kids to, to prepare them, um, you know, for any of these kind of milestones that are coming up. Uh, we just have to be involved. And, yeah. and, and, and it starts to show them that we believe in them. It's not like a gotcha, um, you know, where I, I don't know if you're going to really do that well on that test. It's got to be encouraging and, and giving them the tools and connecting them to the teacher if they're not, um, you know, uh, having regular conversations with the teacher about what, what their, their uh, challenges are. You know, the, the highest level of learning for, for a human being is when you can reflect on your learning um, and, and you start to understand how you learn and, and you know, w what, what speaks to you in terms of learning. It's not the memorization of things. And so the more and more we can get children to think critically that way, um, they will be able to start to be able to, you know, manage their expectations and really build those habits of scholarship that, that they need to be prepared. And to that point, and Jeff, you can probably also like um, talk about this more when we, when we talk about anxiety and we think about ways to kind of help with the anxiety, right? We, we talked about the de-stress and taking time out, but a lot of times when I'm, um, chatting with some of my patients about it, a lot of it's kind of visualization and planning ahead, right? Like think about what that day is gonna be like and plan in advance. If I'm gonna give a big talk, then I wanna plan ahead of time, especially if I know I get a little anxious about it, right? I wanna think about that day, I'm gonna walk out on the stage, I'm gonna like be at the podium and visualize do I have everything I need? And so it's almost like when you get to the point where you're doing it, you've already been through it once or twice in your mind. And I know maybe it sounds silly, but I think that helps as well. Um, and I don't know, Jeff, if, if that's something that you all counsel about or. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you know, I mean, one of the things that's so challenging as a parent is that you can know these things that will help your child, but they may be shut down from really wanting to listen to you about it. And so it's, it's sometimes it's all about the timing, but Absolutely. I mean, you know, visual imagery and, and, and visualizing success for yourself. And, you know, so if a, if a, you know, a kid, I mean, one of the things that, that I do, I tend to do with my parents is, is we, we talk about the whole concept of, you know, parents tend to fall in that uh, helicopter drill sergeant and consultant mode, right? So, and we all can kind of be in those areas, but, you know, so we don't want to be the helicopter parent all the time because then we're rescuing our kid from things. And, and we want to be the consultant. We want to, hey, you know, what's going on today? Uh, well, I'm having this, I'm stressed out. I got these tests, I got all this stuff going on. Hey, you, you wanna talk about it? You wanna, some suggestions? So you're offering this, you're consulting with them. You're offering some help and they may be not ready to, to hear that right. They, they may just wanna vent for a minute. Mm -hmm. Have to kind of let them vent and then try to circle back. You know, I have a parent that has this term of what she does with her kids, she orbits. 
she just kind of orbits them and tries to like find the right time. And, you know, that's hard for us parents that are very, you know, if we're working and we've got, we don't have, you know, seem to have that time. We want to just, you know, Hey, come on, let's go. And, you know, some kids are great with that. They, they want to learn from their parents, but let's face it. Sometimes they're just not in the mood or whatever. So, you know, you have to find that right time, but um, absolutely. If you can get them to understand that concept of visualizing, I mean, that's one of the ways that I, I try to impart that uh, onto my kids. You know, most of the kids I work with, they, they enjoy some type of sports. So, you know, that's sports psychology. So, you know, you, you talk about the studies where, Hey, you have two groups of basketball players equally match this one group. They, to, to, they uh, tested their free throw ability and, uh, and they, group, they tested them all. And then so one group didn't even touch a ball. All they did was visualize that they were shooting the basket, the ball into the basket. And the other group just the, did regular practice. The group that got better, the group that visualized and, and they're just blown away like what? So now if you use that concept with, oh, I'm taking tests, I'm giving a, a, a speaking engagement, whatever, you can use the same type of, uh, you know, um, same type of technique. So, yeah, I, I, um, you're making me think guys about, you know, we've got school coming up next week in certain districts in a couple of weeks and others. And I, I, you know, for some kids, they've never, you know, like kindergartners, first graders, they've never been, some of them haven't even been to school yet. Right. So right. I think, um, you know, driving them to the school, um, you know, just driving around the school and saying, you know, to your point about visualization, it could be, well, right now it's empty, but when we come that first day of school, it's going to be very crowded. There's going to be a lot of folks. It's going to be kind of festive and, and, and fun and just, you know, just starting to become familiar with the space of school and, um, the physical space. Um, I think, I, I don't know. I, I think that that would be really powerful and, even things like sleep habits, um, you know, starting to talk to kids about, <clears throat> you know, let's, let's, so that it's not like that night before, <laughs> but, but, um, but I am curious to know, um, you know, I, I, we can say these things, but Jeff, to your point, you know, sometimes kids don't want to hear it or, or they're just not going to respond to that. And they may not want to go to the school in the car and so forth. So I, you know, I, you know, that's, that's an area that I, I would love to hear about. Like, you know, how do you um, convince them that this is value added, that this is something that we should be doing right now? Well, you know, so I think a lot of times you, you try to get them to join in, in, in some type of conversation out there really, really young. Maybe it's more, you know, Hey, you know, it would be great is if we went and did this and then we got an ice cream after or something, you know, there's nothing wrong with a little ice cream to sweeten the deal, but you know, with, with the older kids, you try to get them to join in some type of discussion about, you know, what would be some ideas that would, would help the situation and you introduce that and hopefully, you know, they will, they will pick up on that and they, or, or, you know, you might give them some choices of things to, you know, to do and one of them be, hey, what about going to the school and then say, well, let's, what, what would be one of these things that you'd like to do today to, you know, just get more acclimated and ready. And they would say, all right, well, I'll go by the school. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I like to say we give, we give kids choices without really giving choices. Like, I, you know, I may say, we're going to go to the, the school. And I was thinking we could either go at 10 or 11. Ah, or 12. Very good. And you tell me what time works best, right? Like, and so then they can feel like they have a say in their destiny and and in the end you're you know going to where you all want to go but I I do want to say I think that the orientations for school especially if you know your child is an anxious child is so important take advantage of the school orientations walk the hallways you know make sure they go through like if they're in middle school and I have a middle schooler now we're going to walk through that hall we're going to go to all of his classes multiple times he's going to feel more comfortable when school starts on Monday that, hey, I've been here, it's familiar, I've met the teachers, N there's not a lot of new stuff, you know, that's going to scare me on the first day. I think oh, definitely try to take advantage of those if you know you have an anxious child. I, I do have a quick um, follow-up because I'm really curious to hear your perspectives. I um, 
tend to have, uh, especially as I've become an adult more, I, I have a little bit more anxiety than I used to when I was a kid and I was more carefree, um, you know, younger. I, my daughter's tend is, is, is trending kind of in the same direction where she's really anxious as well um, with change, especially. And, and my, um, the advice that I was given is yes, visualizing positive outcomes obviously would be great, but sometimes I take it to the other extreme where we say, okay, Yes, this is going to be hard. Let's let's imagine the worst case scenario, let's yeah. imagine the worst possible thing that can happen, and it's not as bad as we really think it can be. Like I think a part of our problem when we're worried about something is that it just seems so big in our head. Then when you like verbalize it, it's really not that bad. Um, so I don't know if, if I should just focus on the positive and stop, you know, walking that path down the, you know, those, you know, kind of spiraling out of control to tends to get really bad when we start thinking about what could what could happen and and yes maybe it is a scary thing going back to school but you know that's how i how we've been doing it lately where we just like okay let's you know yeah it is a scary thing going to let's say middle school from from elementary it's a whole new world but but what what's the worst possible thing that kids won't talk to you you know that, that your teacher is going to be mean or you're you're going to be overwhelmed by all the homework i mean I, as an adult i feel like that helps me so i don't know if this is a good strategy as well well i think i mean that's part of the conversation and i think that's an important part of the conversation just you know try not to fall into the pattern of when you ask them and they say oh well yeah so i'm not gonna my, my friends aren't gonna talk to me and the teacher's gonna be me and you're like oh that's not gonna happen you know you you kind of have to listen to them and just be like yeah that will that's gonna be really tough you're right that's and then the overall message but you're gonna get through this so as a parent, sometimes we try to minimize that real quick, just like, nah, you know, you'll be fine with that, you know, and, but just, you know, try to sit with them with that, you know, that's a lot of anxiety. We can see where you're stressed about that. And, but, you know, I think you're going to get through this. And can, can, can I just say that I think I'll, I'll, I'm, I think I'm older than the folks that are on the, the call, but <clears throat> um for my generation, growing up in the 70s and 80s, um, you know, we were just kind of thrown into stuff. Um, you know, I, I don't even know if they were having this kind of conversation uh, about, you know, re-entry to school or anything like that. Um, we, were, we were immigrants and my parents basically, we, we, our house was walking distance to the school, so we were walkers. And there was no orientation like we just walked down the street and we were in the school and we were you know we we i don't know how we figured it out um but it i don't think that's the recipe for success um you know the way that 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 my experience growing up in upstate new york um you know i wouldn't want to repeat that because i i i think i could have been much more successful at school if i had um you know supportive teachers and 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 parents who felt comfortable going to the school and they were welcomed into the school and and <clears throat> there was a conversation about you know how can we set these these boys up for success as my brother and I um, but I gotta admit that you know I I sometimes have to take myself out of many times outside of my own experience and say you know it's a different time and we really do need to set these kids up for success. It may not have been the way that I was raised or the way that school happened back in the 70s and 80s, but you know, um, it's a different time and, and, and there's plenty of research to show why, why the way that things are working now is much better than in the past. That's a really good point, actually, because when we were talking earlier about helicopter parenting as, as a millennial, I think we, we tend to fear that and we want our kids to be independent and so we're more hands off. But I learned the hard way that actually kids need us to be there, whether, you know, we're, we're we don't necessarily have to be directly involved in like, you know, mark, our, mark their assignments on our own agendas for ourselves to keep up with. But as I think um, uh, we tend to nostalgia, kind of have a little bit of nostalgia when we look back and we're like, well, we made it out fine because, you know, and our parents weren't as involved and look at us, like we were able to figure it out. And I mean, that's true, but we could have been maybe potentially even more <laughs> successful right. in what we're doing. So I don't know. I feel like we tend to look back and say, well, we figured it out. You know, we don't need to be overly involved in our own kids' um, 
you know, academic career, we'll let them kind of sink or swim type situation. Well, and, and I think, I think, I think it's a much more complex world right now. It really is. I mean, we, we, we grew up at a time where I think things were just so much simpler. There was three channels on TV. Um, you know, there was no social media or an internet or World Wide web. And so your, your circle of, of interactions with society and other people was just much smaller. And so it was much, I think it was manageable. It was more manageable. And so um, I just wanted to mention that um, to everybody, because I think a lot of times we put ourselves in our children's place. And I think it's a mistake. Um, we, we really need to look at this much more objectively. Yeah, I do think, I think that's a really good point. And you brought up a few other things that um, definitely need to be discussed when we talk about anxiety and depression and mental health in general. I mean, in this world, we have the internet now, we have um, social media, all different forms of it. And if you think about back in the day when we went to school, you would go to school, you would be with your friends at school, and then you would come home and that's it, right? You Maybe you would have a play date or two with your friends outside of school, but that was the extent of their influence on you. And now when you think about the children that have social media, have access to their phones, their friend influence is seeping into the home. And so now there is no family time, school time, you know, friend time, it's all a blur. And so we really have to be careful about thinking, you know, yes, it's how when I went to school, they'll make it out the same. It'll be, it'll be good. It's, there's just different factors now that are um, coming into play. And I think that may, that plus the fact that we are looking um, into it more, we're more open with dialogue about mental health, I think that's why we're seeing such a rise of anxiety and depression in our society. And it's something that we need to kind of be mindful of um, and not to kind of take this a different way, but specifically with regards to phones, social media, be cautious about when you introduce those things to your child, right? Have a conversation about what your expectations are regarding their use, what's going to happen to them when they, when it comes home, they're going to be put away. They're not allowed in the bedrooms and encourage your children that anyone that they befriend on social media needs to be somebody that you know in person. Um, I think those are ways that we can kind of con control without like showing them it's too much control, but control that environment a little bit more and kind of prevent some of the pressures that they might have from the social media influence. Well, yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that I was um, talking with one of my mentors about um, recently was just what he was calling the epidemic of sleep dis, uh, d deprivation for kids these days. And uh, just, you know, what it ends up masking, just, you know, all it, it ends up looking like a lot of other things like ADD or something like that. But it's, you know, a lot of times these kids are just not getting enough sleep because if you let them go to, to bed with their devices, you know, it, it's, it, it's not great. I mean, they, they may end up being on that device for much longer than you thought. So, you know, they're getting a shorter, much shorter window of sleep and it's just affecting everything for them. So, um, so yeah, the internet safety is so important. I, you know, can tell you all sorts of stories of poor kids that have gotten into things that they shouldn't have and didn't mean to, but, um, you know, especially with just the overall health and just being able to, you know, not only have uh, better sleep, but like you're saying, um, Laura, with the, um, you know, knowing who your kids are connecting with, there's just such a problem with the cyberbullying, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's just, it can be very passive aggressive kind of stuff. It might not be outright, like, you know, terrible things that they're saying, but it's just enough to keep them upset about things about themselves. And some people just like to have that kind of control over people. And so if that's the last thing that this person is hearing at the end of the day is that, you know, somebody said they were fat or something like that, you know, that they, so they go to bed with that and they sit with that and then they don't, you know, they, they may not reach out to you and you may, you know, if you're not knowing what's going on. So can't, have, can't be too careful. Can't be too careful. Absolutely. The new, you know, the new recommendations are to wait until eight 
meaning wait until eighth grade to give your child um, a cell phone. Obviously, it's going to be child dependent and family dependent on based on what the needs are of the child and of the family that, you know, is that child being dropped off a lot and the parents need to connect? Is that happening earlier? You know, that's a discussion that needs to happen within the family. But just recognize that, no, not every child has a phone when they get into middle school right away. Not every child has access to social media. So when your child comes to you and says, well, everybody else does it, that's that's not a true statement. It may feel that way, but you can say, I recognize that and we'll find ways for you to connect with your friends in other ways, but you know, let's, let's wait a little bit and then um, you can save yourself a lot and your child a lot of heartache as opposed to introducing it too early before they're ready for that. Yeah, and it, it, there's so much here that, that I just absolutely love um, hearing just there's, there's some of this is just going back to basics on certain things, you know, um, sleep, proper sleep. Um, I, I will tell you that the most, when we have children at the school who act out on a consistent basis, and then it, and it bubbles up to my level, like where it's escalated to my level, a lot of times, what I find out is that the sleep habits are really not where they need to be. I mean, I just start asking questions and usually it's another administrator in the room or a counselor and um, a parent will say, well, I just, I just, they can't, I can't get them to sleep before 10 o'clock or, or something like that. Well, when that's repeated day after day after day and children are coming in with five hours sleep, it's just not healthy. I mean, um, and, and so there's just no routine at home to help them kind of have that soft landing, you know, an hour before this kind of, you know, regular routine. And if it starts at an early age, the benefits just are amazing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, for those parents that are online, I just can't tell you how important it is to establish good sleep routines and good rituals at home that, that, you know, kids are in pajamas an hour before they have to go to sleep. They have to brush their teeth a half an hour before. And there's this kind of likes, you know, almost checklist that happens and then it's time to go to sleep. And, you know, I, um, uh, reading to kids at night, having the ritual of reading to your kids. Um, you know, at our school, we don't, we have a no homework policy from kindergarten to second grade because all the research says that homework during that those grades really doesn't impact student learning. But what does impact student learning is reading to your kids, reading with them and having them practice their reading and, and develop their literacy skills. So just having that as part of the ritual, it's really a back to basics kind of approach, but it works. And, um, and so, you know, having dinner together as a family uh, a few times a week, if it's possible, um, you know, so that you know what's happening in your child's life and so forth. Um, it's, it's, I, I see that those families that are doing those things are, are, are able to cope with some of these other stressors a lot easier. I, and I may be painting an idealistic picture, but at least it's something that we can strive for. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think routines, anytime you can establish good routines in the home, whatever those routines are, it is always one of the top things that we recommend. If, whether we're dealing with anxiety, depression, attention deficit disorder, we always start with establish some structure, some routine to the day, that you know, when your child comes home from school, they know that the backpack goes here, I'm gonna have a snack, I have 15 to 30 minutes of downtime, maybe another 30 minutes of like some homework time and you know, that they know what's happening because if every day is different, then it becomes chaotic. And you know, to your point about the sleep, I'll never forget a patient that was have, coming in because they were saying their medicines weren't working for, for ADHD. And, you know, we got more of a history and, and I said, well, you know, here it says you're only sleeping like five hours a night. I said, I don't care what medicine I give you. You're not going to be able to focus at school if you're not getting a good night's sleep. And that is why we kind of talk about the treatment of some of these things being multi-approach. It's not just let's throw a medicine on here or, or even let's talk to a therapist. It's, you need to get sleep. You need to limit your screen time. You need to eat healthy. You need to get regular physical activity. All those things that people are like, what? That doesn't make sense. But that all plays a role 
in the mental health. And we have to remember that. Yeah, uh, Hiba, I think we, I think, you know, the, the audience is, you know, predominantly Muslim. Um, and I do think that it's important to build on what Laura said in terms of therapists. Um, you know, if, if your child needs help, um, you know, there's a stigma in our community, frankly, about seeking um, assistance from a therapist. And, and you know, I, I can tell you that, you know, for those families that I'm aware of that, that are taking advantage of a therapist, it works. Um, they have somebody that they can talk to um, that, you know, is, can be objective, can look at it from an outside perspective. Um, sometimes that involves family therapy. It's not just the individual because, you know, sometimes parents are enablers for certain behaviors and, and brothers and sisters and siblings and those types of things. Um, I, 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 I think, you know, in our community, I'll just say that um, in the last two, three years in particular, this has now become a, a topic that people are willing to talk about a, a lot more than they were before, right up from the, the Friday sermons to, to other venues and so forth. And I'm, I'm so encouraged by that because um, it means that to your point earlier, somebody had made the point about there's physical health and there's mental health. And um, just like we seek professionals for our physical health, we should seek professionals for our mental health as well. Um, so that we can be a hundred percent. Yeah, no, this is, this is really amazing. I'm, I'm actually taking notes. So I don't forget because I, I think um, it's really important. These um, tips are, have been really invaluable and hopefully I'm glad, I'm glad we're recording this. So hopefully um, later, if we do forget any um, tidbit, we can, um, you know, remind ourselves and then also contribute to the conversation again, continue um, guys to uh, post your questions. We'll, we'll have, um, opportunities hopefully to continue this conversation. Um, I think uh, everybody's really brought up important points and you have, you're right, I think as, as in the Muslim community, the reason maybe, and this is just, again, a lot of it is because um, uh, it, is, it is stigmatized, um, but at the same time, I think the emphasis on mental health being um, a necess necessitating, like really having the necessity to seek a professional doesn't necessarily invalidate um, you know, our faith and our spirituality, it, it's not mutually exclusive just because, um, you know, I'm seeing a therapist doesn't mean I'm not praying properly, for example. So I think people tend to, to say, well, you, you know, if you're depressed, it's because you need to pray and, and be better, um, you know, in your, in your rituals, as far as uh, our faith is concerned. And that is obviously part of, you know, what we believe as Muslims to be part of our, our you know, mental health care package if you if you will but but it's, it doesn't necessarily um, mean that we we shouldn't be on that seek just like we would seek physicians help for a physical problem um, to seek professionals and in, in mental health uh, um, concerns as well and and I, I do want to mention this because I know we keep talking about our children but we should set an example for our kids and not necessarily only getting them help but also ourselves as adults whether you know, individually or with our spouses, if we're married, um, you know, a lot of us have issues at work um, and we don't know how to properly address them or, or navigate our, um, our own emotions. And some of us think it's, you know, our boss's problem and they quit their job thinking that's, oh, um, thinking that the, 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 the boss is, is, you know, kind of externalizing their issues. But at the end of the day, um, I think a lot of it has to do with how we ourselves deal with, um, you know, problems and, and, um, and so I think uh, at, to set an example for our own children and, and um, being able to not just, you know, um, kind of, uh, you know, externalize and blame our environment and maybe take, take it in and say, and, and empower our own selves and, and handling our, our personal, um, you know, issues, whether it's with our, you know, again, spouse or our parents or whatever stresses we have in our lives and, and kind of tackling them head on and rather than just kind of saying, okay, well, you know, life is life and, and we, we can yeah. just hopefully pray through it and, and get, get through it. But that's not, I, I don't think that's how um, even Islamically we are taught to approach mm -hmm. our problems. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see. Uh, and unfortunately, as a, again, minority community, as a Muslim community, we've seen 
unfortunately, that we are more vulnerable um, to mental health issues. So, so not only are we not addressing it, but we're also potentially even more likely to have these issues, just given the fact that we, you know, because of Islamophobia or whatever, um, it, you know, environmental issues we're dealing with, you know, our, our youth especially are most vulnerable. Um, there was a recent article published in, in JAMA, and I shared it with you all um, on the panel earlier to, that showed that basically um, rates of suicide potentially are higher in the Muslim community. Um, and, and that unfortunately is something that is, is not helped by the fact that we don't talk about it as far as uh, how to address it. Um, amongst our youth. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that, how about uh, particularly uh, how to prevent, um, you know, kind of this, this conversation from, from going forward, how to best address it. It's, it's, it's been um, really enlightening and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I, I do agree with you. I think um, in the Islamic faith, we tend not to talk about mental health. And when we do, it's usually centered around spirituality, just like you discussed, you know, you need to maybe go to the mosque more, you need to pray more, you need to, you know, spend more time with God. And, you know, from a spiritual sense, I like the way you said the package. Yes, that is all true. But there's also other aspects to it that we do need to take into account. And um, I really appreciated that you sent that information from the JAMA article. And just so people out there know what the statistics were, they basically surveyed almost 3,000 people um, about their re reports of suicide attempts within their lifetime. And 8%, about 8% of Muslim people responded that they have attempted suicide um, at least once in their lifetime. And that was almost twice as much as any other religious group. And so, you know, we could probably have a whole nother week long seminar are about why that's the case, but we do know that after 9-11, there's been a lot of um, uh, pushback against Muslims and you know, Islamophobia has been on the rise, especially in those last several years um, dealing with travel bans and that you know, re-amplifies, are we welcome here? Are we not welcome here? Are we safe here? Um, and so those things are churning through the minds of adults and also they're being absorbed by the kids that are hearing us talk about it, seeing it happen out at, you know, in their streets. And I think the first step in kind of destigmatizing all of this is dialogue, having these conversations and making sure that if it's happening, that don't be ashamed to talk to your friend about it. It's okay. You know, you can say, you know, I think my kid is just getting really anxious, or I, I think my kid is depressed and I, I feel like I need to seek help. You never know what someone else might be going through and just being able to open up about those experiences is the first step, I think, to really achieving long-term success in treatment. Well, and I mean, I'm so interested in, you know, I definitely appreciate you uh, sending that study. I'm so interested in finding out more about why that is. Um, I, 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 you know, this is, could be a, a totally wrong, but it just kind of brings up, um, you know, in not too long ago, I was looking into suicide and rates, and I think the highest rate of suicide in the world was in South Korea, where, and, and it was attributed to basically kids that were, so, and I'm talking about for children, and, and it was attributed to kids that were so focused on getting into a university that, you know, and they might not get into the right university, they, you know, work and work and work and work to, you know, their whole lives to, you know, go, they're going from, and I know we don't do all this in America all the time, but I mean, there is some families that really, you know, tend to push their kids and maybe not too, you know, maybe they don't realize they're pushing them a little too far. And I'm not trying to sound like you can't push your kids. You have to find that balance, but, you know, there, there tends to be this shame that, that kids carry with them if they don't, you know, get that approval from their parents. And a lot of times you might not even know there's, no, it's not that they're depressed. It's not, even, you know, maybe there is some anxiety, but if they don't fee, if they feel ashamed, that shame can be so strong and it can be a very impulsive thing for them to just take their life. So, um, you know, we, again, it's all about communication. It's about parents, you know, being in touch with their kids and, you know, we, we want to see them push themselves and get do the best that they can do. But, you know, we have to be careful not to push 
too hard. And, and sometimes that's us putting our values on them too much. Um, so, you know, it's, it just, I, I just wonder how many of those suicides are, you know, related to, you know, just academic pressure and, and you know, just fears of that. I, I don't underplay that there is uh, the Islamophobia as well that's playing into that. Yeah, I, I think that you bring up a really good point when we look at depression and the associated risks um, for depression, educational underachievement is, you know, kind of at the top of that list. And so whether it's true underachievement or a perceived underachievement because you're not meeting expectations that have been set, um, I think those things play a role in it, as well as you know, poor relationships with your family members or your friends. And so again, that could be based off of, you know, um, expectations that just aren't aligned. Um, and then one other thing we haven't touched on it, but I do want to bring it up, alcohol and drug use. Um, I think a lot of times in the Islamic faith, we feel like, oh, we don't have to worry about that. You know, it's against our religion. So none of our kids are, you know, drinking and none of our kids are um, doing drugs. But that is not the case. And so we need to be mindful of that. We need to keep our um, eyes and ears open. Um, now that we have, uh, you know, marijuana legalized in many areas, um, even if they began smoking weed a little bit more, you can start seeing some academic underachievement. You can start seeing some of these things that we've been talking about, these symptoms. So we just need to be aware that these things um, you know, being a Muslim does not exempt us from any of these things that we are seeing within the society we live in and just keep, keep that in mind. Uh, I think you're on mute, Eva. sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I had um, a visitor earlier. I don't want, <laughs> want you guys to hear. Um, uh, my brother's dog just, uh, anyway. So I, a lot of us tend to be in denial about these issues thinking just, you know, obviously everybody knows that we're not allowed to drink so therefore our kids won't drink and therefore they're not going to be but but you know there's just so much we need to I think almost um, just come to the point where we just there's an expectation that everybody around you is you know maybe um, doing something let's just kind of start from there and say okay hopefully you're not but let's just have a conversation so that you know we we can address it um, you know realistically I think more than anything um, and and another point I, I kind of wanted to just mention this real quick because we always talk about communication being key but I noticed um, when you have multiple children sometimes we feel like oh we sat down at dinner together we do it every day therefore you know, we have no problems communicating because we're always together all the time, especially during COVID. I mean, we were together almost too much. But but I think for us with multiple kids, I think communicating is most effective when it's one on one because there are some topics that, you know, one sibling won't want the other to know about or concerns that they might have. Um, and, and just knowing them as individuals, I think, is really important. I learned that also the hard way, so I wanted to mention it. Um, we did have a quick question from the from our um, comments on Facebook. Uh, I wanted to ask the panel, a lot of um, our parents that have uh, have younger kids that missed some school um, in person, especially young kids that really couldn't make the most out of academics virtually uh, younger, like first grade, um, you know, uh, four to five years old, um, they're, they're concerned that they're behind with, um, you know, learning how to read and write and, and they just want to know if there's anything they could do to address this concern that you know, that their kids may be high in because they haven't been in school in person for a couple of years. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one comment about that, and then I'll probably, I'm going to lay it at the hands of uh, Ehab, but um, I just want to remind parents that in America, we start our kids school early, but there are many places around the world that do, do not even start school until age of seven. Mm -hmm. So I think keeping that in mind in terms of socialization and, you know, reading and writing, as long as we're doing things at home, um, reading to them, allowing them time to be creative. Uh, I think that's important. Um, but you have, I don't know if you have other things about this topic. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, parents sometimes have this like map of the, this roadmap of that their kids from first grade all the way up to, you know, 12th grade. And, and this is the career they're going to get into and so forth. And, I tend to find that a lot of times it's those parents that have the most concern around some of these questions. Um, you know, we have to just recognize that we've all gone through a pandemic and it's still going on. And, um, and this is, you know, we, we've, you've heard this term over and over again, these are unprecedented times. 
Um, and I know that we all want to make up for learning loss, um, but there was this great article written by Ron Berger in The Atlantic. Um, he's the chief uh, academic officer for expeditionary learning for EL education. And, and the title of the article is Our Kids Are Not Broken. And I think that that's really important because there was this sense, uh, uh, you know, about six months, maybe a year ago, that kids have had so much learning loss um, that they're in, in social and emotional stress that they're coming back to school broken somehow. And, um, and we can't look at it that way. The, the approach that he's advocating is that we take almost like a physical therapist type of approach and become very personalized with each child and say, look, what areas do I need to strengthen in this child? So if my elbow got hurt in an accident, a physical therapist is not going to look at my entire body. They're going to focus in on the elbow and they're going to say, how do we make your elbow stronger? And so I think that that's the way we've got to look at it. Um, and certainly there are things that parents can do from a tutoring perspective or something else. But I think right now going back into school, the most important thing they can do is to help their kids acclimate to school, to feel like they belong at school, um, you know, have a good relationship with the with the teachers that their children are interacting with and just ease their kids back into school. And just like Laura said, read to your kids. If, if they're struggling in math or something like that, work with them on it. And just like a physical therapist would, but let's not overstress the children. Um, kids are very resilient. And when, when, when I look back, you know, I came, uh, when I came to America, I was one year ahead. Uh, in the Middle East. And so because of my age, they brought me back a year. Um, you know, I'm 54 right now, like that one year, who cares? You know, I, I it, it had nothing to do with my ability to get into a really good college or, or whatever. I, it was the best thing they could have done uh, to put me back a year. I'm not saying that we, we want to do that wholesale for all children, but let's not, let's not over uh, analyze this thinking that, you know, a little bit of learning loss that may have happened in math or in English is somehow, you know, going to close the door for our children to get into the type of college that they want to, or, or um, the type of program that we want them to get into and so forth. So I, I think we just have to be, um, we have to work at this in small pieces and, and really partner with our teachers. And, and understand that the teachers are under an immense amount of pressure right now. You know, teachers are coming back into the schools. Most of the children that are going to be in the school are unvaccinated, right? Because they're elementary school students in particular. Um, so teachers are under a lot of stress too. Um, they've been having to do a lot of work. Parents have been partnering with teachers. You know, we're all going in back into school and it's, and it's high anxiety. Um, what we need to do is just, just get our, ease ourselves back into it. And I'm not trying to really minimize the situation or anything like that, but um, being stressful is not going to, it's not going to help our children. Um, so, you know, let's reestablish their social, social um, well-being, their social connections with other children, and, and then look at those specific areas that they need help with and help them strengthen those, those areas. They're not broken. I actually look at this in the other way. I, I see it as a positive thing when you uh, instead focus on the fact that our children are learning how to really um, you know, maximize their potential and be resilient and learn how to, to maneuver around, you know, unchartered territory in, uh, you know, in a stable way, kind of understand that, you know, we're, we're going to be having to deal with problems in our life as we get older and how do we navigate around these problems and, and to learn it at a young age with our parents and, you know, coaches and our teachers around us. I think this is, this is a learning experience that is invaluable that I think. Yeah. We, we well, you're, amazing. you're bringing up a great point and, and that Ron also brought up and, you know, there's all this research around grit and um, mm -hmm. that um, uh, Angela Duckworth has done professor in, in the Philly area. And, and the thing is, is that our kids have learned a lot in the last year, you know, they've, they've learned how to uh, 
um, you know, use different tools, online tools. They've learned um, different ways to become resilient to your point. And so we can't come into this with a deficit mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to think about it in terms of what are the assets that we have? We have children that have navigated this very well. And they've been, you know, I'm really proud of the kids, in fact, in terms of what they've been able to accomplish. And so, again, going back to the earlier point about, like, we need to believe in our kids. Um, you know, our teachers need to believe in them and we need to believe in them. And so we need to be rooting for them. And, um, and to the extent that we can, you know, help them ease back into school, they're just going to take off after that. That's really my belief. That's awesome. I'm, I'm really optimistic and, and you guys, have, I, I really, I mean, this has been invaluable and I hope everybody has an opportunity to listen to your um, tips. I, I want to give you all one last um, opportunity. We're right ar around seven and we have to wrap up, but I want to give you guys a kind of a closing remark. Uh, and then um, before I close out, I want to mention, um, we will be emailing out this video to the community. It will be, um, it will stay online on our RCM uh, Facebook page. Um, where you can again continue the conversation if you choose. Um, but also we'll be sending out some resources for parents and for individuals looking to, to continue the conversation and continue to educate themselves on what they can do um, uh, to, to help promote mental health. And uh, as we ease this transition, hopefully back to school for our kids, I think um, that will be very useful. And, and again, I, I wanna take a moment again to appreciate our, our panelists. Um, our very busy panelists who've taken time off on their day off, hopefully, um, to, to share with us their wisdom. And, um, and really, uh, this has been invaluable. Again, uh, hopefully the beginning of many conversations. So I'll, I'll close off on my end. I appreciate this as a parent. Um, I, I want to give you guys a chance to give me your last, uh, hopefully, um, anything that you, you might have uh, wanted to say that didn't get a chance. Hopefully, this is a, this is a good time. Go ahead, guys. I, one thing I wanted to say, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, I would be remiss as a pediatrician if I didn't kind of um, tack on to what you have was saying the pandemic is still with us. Okay, we are going back to school, but what we want to do is to make sure that our kids are able to stay in school. So let's do our part to try to help make that happen. Right. So if you're eligible, any if you're age 12 and up, please get vaccinated. Um, if you have not been vaccinated, please wear a mask. And and actually, those of you that are vaccinated, if you're going to be in, in large groups, please continue to wear a mask if you don't know what the vaccination status of other people around you. Um, continue to keep your distance, wash your hands. Um, you know, those same principles apply. We are still in the middle of a pandemic. And I think we know that kids do better when they're in school. And the idea is we want to keep them in school. So these are ways that we can help to do that. Okay. Just want to wish everybody luck and and uh, just enjoy this last bit of your summer uh, before the school starts and and you know visualize success. Yeah, and I think I've sp spoken plenty, but uh, the only other thing that I would say is that you know. Uh, as administrators, uh, I can tell you, uh, I, I can speak for other administrators when I say we're grateful to parents for partnering with us and our teachers um, through this last year and a half. Um, we know that you've had to do so much more work in terms of educating, you know, your children with us. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to continue to partner uh, and continue to co-create what the next looks like in terms of education. And so um, stay involved, stay engaged with your schools and just understand that um, everybody has the best interests uh, in, in your children and that to, to the extent that we can partner, we're gonna, we're gonna come out even stronger. So I, I really appreciate this opportunity and I learned a lot from Laura and Jeff today. So I just wanna say thank you guys too for this opportunity. Thank you, Heba. Really, really learned a lot. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your time uh, as listeners and the panelists. And hopefully we'll see you next time, guys. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Yeah.